Well, thank you very much for taking the time to explore these issues with us. Uh, there are a couple things I'd just like to say about my own background in terms of dealing with this material. It's always important to be very clear when I'm talking about law and legal test cases and things that I am not a lawyer and this is not licensed legal advice and if you should have any specific questions regarding accommodation or universal design or test questions please like seek licensed legal counsel. That said, I am a licensed occupational therapist and my background is in breaking apart activities and tasks that people do and finding ways they can do them in spite of what gets in their way like a disability or a learning style question. So when I go into the legal literature, what I'm doing is drawing on case law and decisions that give us good questions to ask ourselves when we are implementing human rights law in higher education so that we're able to make sure we meet the duty to accommodate as a human rights tribunal might expect us to. So we're using those questions to unpack what we do in a way that proactively makes sure we design for inclusion. So having worked with people with disabilities in higher education for many years and then having done my dissertation on human rights law applied to clinical education, I now work in human rights broadly with all the designated groups looking at all kinds of accommodation issues. So I hope that helps you kind of understand where the OT became the human rights officer and that I'm not a lawyer but I delve into lit legal literature. So that said, we can move on to some of that legislation. So what we want to talk about today is how to link together the legislated mandate that we have and the duty to accommodate with how to go from a reactive accommodation model to a proactive model that's housed in accessibility principles. We're going to look then at what some of those proactive strategies might be and we're going to start with the beginnings of universal design in universal architectural design and I'll walk you through the evolution into universal instructional design and where we are now with universal design for learning. So the duty to accommodate is based on one primary principle that's really important to keep in mind, and that is that equity means treating different people differently. Because we're not all the same, if we expect everything to be done exactly the same, we're really not giving everyone an equal chance, are we? So one of the examples that I often use with that is I refer to people who are golfers, which I am not, but when you give someone who's golfing a handicap, you give them a balancing factor that enables them to compete fairly regardless of where they're starting and where their teammates are starting. So while we don't tend to use the word handicap anymore in that way, the notion of equalizing opportunity is similar. So we treat people differently to be sure that they're treated fairly because fair might not always mean the same. So let's have a little run at that. Let's see what it's like to do something and see how many different ways might have been helpful. I want you to think about a song, so just take a minute. Think of a song you know really well. So it might be your national anthem, it might be a religious song, a folk song, popular song, something very familiar to you. No question you know the words. Could be happy birthday, could be a holiday song. And I want you to use your non-dominant hand and write the words without singing it just quietly write the words to the song. I'll give you 60 seconds. Go. No singing. No whispering. That would be cheating. Notice what's getting in your way. Okay, stop. So was that easy? Was that difficult? What got in your way? What would have made it easier? Probably writing it with your dominant hand would have helped, but no, I wanted you to do it in a particular way that I felt was important. Maybe if you could have sung the song, because of course you know the content of the song, it's not that you don't know the words, so why was it so hard to get them out? How much of the song did you get through? Did you get through all of it? I bet you didn't. So we could have let you write it with your dominant hand, we could have let you sing the song, we could have let you hum it under your breath while you were writing it, 
We could have done a number of other things. Maybe we could have let you type it with two hands. Maybe you type faster than you handwrite. And would that have really affected how well you know the song or whether you do or don't know the song? Of course not. You know that material. You just needed to demonstrate it in a different way. So you can see how if we just look at what is the objective, what are we trying to find out? Do you know the words to the song? The way we ask you to do that may completely block your demonstration of knowledge. So let's keep that in mind while we look at how many different ways we can enable learners to demonstrate their knowledge. So back to the legislation, that kind of gave you a sense of why we're talking about this. So what are we talking about? We're talking about provincial human rights acts and all of the provincial acts are very similar in the definition of disability that they put out. They're very similar in the kinds of things they expect of us. For instance, the duty to accommodate is a province-wide requirement. It's true everywhere. And all of the acts require that we accommodate with three principles in mind. So that would be dignity, individualization, and inclusion. So the goal is to include people with dignity in a way that meets their individual needs. I put this definition of disability up here from the New Brunswick Human Rights Act just so you can see how dense it is. So this is where everybody says, oh, her slides have way too much text. And that's true, but the reason it's up here is to show you how comprehensive this definition really is. So let's have a look at what it includes. And in some provinces, it says, of any etiology, including but not limited to. So very, very comprehensive definition of disability. Physical disability is any degree of disability, infirmity, malformation, or disfigurement caused by, and there's a list of things, bodily injury, illness, birth defect, including but not limited to, any degree of paralysis, diabetes, epilepsy, amputation, lack of physical coordination, blindness or visual impediment, deafness or hearing impediment, muteness or speech impediment, on and on. And they're all very similar. So point being, a very comprehensive definition. It goes on to talk about mental disability. That was all just physical disability. This is mental disability, which you'll see articulates explicitly learning disability. So learning disability is in the act, and it's becoming more and more common in acts. It hasn't always been in every province's Human Rights Act, but it's showing up. And so that's very empowering for our students with learning disabilities because they see themselves reflected in the legislation. And it's powerful for those of us who need to accommodate learning disability because it's right there in the legislation. As is mental disorder, so that would include things like emotional illnesses, psychological, psychiatric conditions. So it's, again, very comprehensive. So when we're talking about accommodation and the duty to accommodate all of those kinds of conditions, we're really talking about something that is a human rights code requirement. It is reactive and individualized. So it means someone comes along and says, you've designed this curriculum or this building or this course requirement, and I need it to be done differently. So we react and say, oh, well, what can we do for you to enable you to have equal participation in this course? So there's an anti-discrimination element there. It's a negative impetus, and the disability is assumed to be in the person, which you could see from that big, long definition. That was all about the body and the person. There was nothing in there about the environment, was there? But when you take a case to the tribunals, and when you look at what the Supreme Court says about where the disability resides, the focus is not on impairment. It's on the structure we've created. It's on the differential impact of systems and curricula that we create. So accommodation, again, attempts to defeat discrimination with that dignity and respect, the individualized response to the point of undue hardship, which is another story, and let me just stop on that for a second. Undue hardship is very difficult to prove in a post-secondary environment because it focuses largely on finance. And as long as the operating grant is big enough to fund the accommodation, it's pretty hard to show that the institutional level that we can't afford it. So we don't see a lot of success with those kinds of complaints that are based on inability to afford the accommodation. When you look at health and safety requirements under undue hardship or whether a bona fide requirement is compromised, that's a little different story. 
So we also point, accommodate only to the point of not compromising what is a bona fide requirement. And we'll look at how to determine those in just a minute. So let's kind of pull this together into a little bit of a problem solving tree and see how do we actually tackle this kind of question. So this is a strategy that I've found useful over the years where I start with the first question and make sure that I answer them in sequence because they're kind of cumulative. And that gives us a sense of whether we really should proceed with accommodation or really we're done and we need to do something else altogether. So the first question is whether there is a health condition, yes or no. And this is where the medical model tells us we have to have documentation where our act says there needs to be some evidence of this condition or how do we know you come under the act. Um, so we look first of all for that documentation from a third party and say, what is the issue here? Is there an issue with the body that affects how we participate? If not, maybe the person needs study skills or remediation in tutoring or counseling or some other kind of approach to enable them to succeed. If there is a health condition, does that actually affect your participation? Because it might not. Lots of us wear glasses, doesn't affect our participation. Lots of people have medical conditions that are successfully medicated. They don't have any problem participating. So just the presence of the condition doesn't mean we need an accommodation. There has to be that barrier to participating. So say there is, okay, then maybe is it skill building? Is it something we can remediate even though there's a condition? Nope, there's still a barrier. We go to the next step and say, so is this accommodation that's being requested appropriate to the disability? Is it going to address the problem? So this is where I think about folks who have come in, particularly parents sometimes, who come in and say, well, my student is hard of hearing and they need a sign language interpreter and a digital recording and a transcript and a manual note taker. And you think for a minute, wait a minute, we're going to have a massive circus of people trying to get down the lecture. Is there one way that would work best and be most efficient and meet the student's needs? So let's figure this out. Or a student will say, um, I have a learning disability and I need to dictate everything. So, um, you know, I want my computer to talk to me. What? <laughs> if you're dictating to your computer, it's not talking back to you. You're talking to it. So sometimes we need to help people suss out what they really need and what's going to work in the context that they're in. So you do that in determining whether the accommodation is appropriate. So we've got a disability, we've got a barrier, we've got an appropriate accommodation. Then we have to say, okay, now are the essential requirements or the bona fide requirements of the course respected in implementing this accommodation? So then we go in and say, well, why do we do it this way? Is there a reason that we do it this way? What is that reason? Can we change it? If not, why? And if we can, then we're golden and we do. That's when you accommodate. But it takes that analysis to get us from a request to an accommodation. So going back to what I said about all those medical definitions and those terms including but not limited to everything you can think of that might medically be wrong with you, and I said, but the focus is not impairment. So this is a quote from the Supreme Court in the Gronofsky case that talks about where the emphasis needs to be. So Gronofsky says, Section 15.1 of the Charter and Rights and Freedoms is ultimately concerned with human rights and discriminatory treatment, not with biomedical conditions. So what that means is that the concern of human rights legislation is really more about how we treat one another, the structures we set up that enable or disable people's participation, than it is about documented disability. So it's not a question of how disabled are you, how blind are you, how deaf are you, it's about how did we build this lecture so you could or couldn't participate. So let me read the full quote to you. In summary, while the notions of impairment and functional limitation, real or perceived, are important considerations in the disability analysis, the primary focus is on the inappropriate legislative or administrative response of the state. Now, that may sound very um, high level, and we're not talking about the state in the sense of government. We're talking about social structures that we choose to put in place, like how and where and when we deliver education is a function of the state as it is a function of the collectivity of all of us generating that. And if we generate that experience to be accessible, we'll reach more learners. So let's look at the accessibility part of this. 
So we've talked about accommodation being reactive and something we do in order to not be discriminating. But accessibility is proactive. It's a systemic approach that says, let's put a positive impetus on this. Let's look at the environment as containing the disability and see how we can build structures and environments that are inclusive of all learners. And in Ontario, many of you might be familiar with the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, which actually legislates initiatives to improve accessibility. So it's not waiting for a disabled person to come along and say, I need this done differently. It says, let's think of you first and design this thing so the most possible number of learners and kinds of learners can participate equally. So it's a, you can see it's a very proactive strategy. So if we just pull those up together for a minute and look at the comparison between accommodation and accessibility, you can see the comparison we've just done. Accommodation is reactive, accessibility is proactive. Accommodation is an individual response to a person. Accessibility is a systemic approach to the whole environment. Accommodation is anti-discrimination. Accessibility is pro-accessibility and inclusion. It's a positive approach. Disability is in the person if you're doing accommodation, and disability is in the environment if you're doing accessibility. So let's talk about this notion of bona fides. I've dropped that term a couple of times, and I haven't explained it, so I think I better do that. And let's take a look at where that comes up. So in the legislation, most of the acts will have a clause like this that says, a limitation or exclusion or denial because of disability shall be permitted if that is based on a bona fide qualification as determined by the commission. Well, what does that mean? What is a bona fide qualification? So this is a concept that comes from the employment sector where the questions I'm about to go through with you arose in the first place and were determined to be very useful in unpacking what is a legitimate or bona fide requirement. So it's known uh, in the employment sector as a BFOR, bona fide occupational requirement. I prefer to call it in our setting a bona fide academic requirement. So let's just take that notion and move it into academia. So what we're talking about is something that cannot be adapted without compromising the essential nature of the task, the thing that you're doing. If you accommodate it, it isn't that thing anymore. So what would that be like? That would be like if you do CPR and you know that you have to do compressions at a certain rate and breaths at a certain rate in order to revive that person, and you say, well, you know, I need frequent breaks as an accommodation. What's going to happen to your patient? If you don't trigger the electrochemical mechanism that gets the heart and lungs going again, they're going to die that would not be okay. So that rate and the way that you deliver procedures like that would be a bona fide occupational requirement. It's based on the body, it's based on science, it's based on the way something external actually functions. It's not on assumptions, it's not about how we've always done it, it's not about I think it should be done that way, it's the way it is in the real world. So what I call that is a real life delimiter. There's something out there that says you just can't do this any other way. You can't do CPR with extra time. Another example would be whether you can pass a fitness test to be a firefighter. Seems intuitively obvious. You would want to be pretty physically fit to be a firefighter. But one of the cases we're going to talk about is based on the assumption that you have to be a male firefighter and only a male fitness test will suffice, which was found to be sexist and discriminatory because you don't have to fit, pass a male-only fitness test. You can pass it if you're a woman too. So how the requirement is defined is critically important. Another bona fide that comes up in our academic settings is the need to publish technical research or write technical articles before they're obsolete. So one of the things we do, particularly in graduate education, is we teach people to do original research, to write and to publish in a timely way, not just because we want them to graduate, which we do, but also because if you can't get your stuff into the literature, you're going to miss the discourse. You're not going to be contributing to knowledge if it's out of date by five years, right? So it takes a while, as it is, to get into the literature. So you want your technical evolving field. You've got to be keeping up with that. And so there's a bona fide occupational requirement that feeds why we do things in a certain timely way. Now, that doesn't mean there's no flexibility, but 
there is also a real effect of not ever getting done. You never contribute to the discourse, and that's what graduate education is for. So we have to look at how far can we stretch before we compromise the actual thing we're doing. So here are the questions that the case law has given us in order to unpack what's a bona fide requirement and what isn't. And this is where I've taken these questions and applied them in academia to help us because we don't really have a set of questions or a protocol that allows us to say, why do we do this the way we do it? Should we do it this way? What kind of paradigm can we use to analyze those requirements? So I thought, let's use the ones we would be faced with if we went to a tribunal on a failure to accommodate. So we're going to say, this requirement is bona fide. What's the question? The first question is whether it's established in good faith. So we don't have a lot of trouble with that in academia. We don't really come up with arbitrary, make it difficult on purpose kinds of requirements. So most academic requirements, I think we would probably say, yes, the, the requirement is established in good faith. So is it rationally connected to the purpose of the job or the task or the course that you're teaching? Well, probably it's rationally connected or why would you include it, right? But that's worth thinking about for a minute. Mm, how connected is it? How important is it in the context of the course, not after they graduate someday they're going to have to be able to do this? That's the real world question and that's a different story. We accommodate in the context of the course because you can't deny accommodation in the course in anticipation of what the student may or may not do after the course. If you have any questions about that, feel free to email me. It's a whole other story. But this real world connection is an assumption we often make because we want students to be independent learners. We know that someday they're going to have to give a presentation. We want them to be able to do that, so we tuck it into our curriculum because it's a someday thing. They better know. But if that's not what we're teaching, if that's not the course objective, giving presentations or writing essays, which it might be, but if it isn't, we can't deny accommodation today in anticipation of an other situation tomorrow. So sidebar note, keep that in mind. But mostly the requirements we ask of students are rationally connected to the course. So here's the question that really starts getting to the nub. Is there evidence that the requirement is actually necessary in order to achieve the course objectives? Do you have to do this thing this way in order to meet the course objectives, or are there other ways? And the other ways chapter is all about universal design, and we'll get there in a few minutes. So we have one more question that helps us analyze whether what we're asking of students is discriminatory or not. And in my research, my subjects liked this evidence question the best. Personally, I like the next question the best. Is the requirement or standard socially constructed such that it excludes various learning styles or people with disabilities for a reason that is irrelevant based on assumptions about function or about the student's learning needs or assumptions about the task. So let's take a little closer look at that question. So this question asks whether the requirement we're expecting the student to meet has been created basically, socially constructed, as opposed to being a natural delimiter. It's not, you know, a, an element of nature. It's not something that was defined by the law of gravity. It's something we decided was important and asked the student to do, such that it actually ends up excluding some people who might not be able to learn it that way or demonstrate that knowledge or access that print for a reason that's not really relevant. Like, does it matter whether you read your text on a kudo or on a laptop? Or does it matter if you read it with braille or in large print? Does it matter if you don't read it at all, you listen to it? Really? Does that matter as much as the fact that you know the material? So if we say, well, you have to read this um, on D2L in our learning management system, and it only comes up in that size font. So, you know, that's what you have to do. That really isn't relevant to the reading and learning of the material, is it? So this question asks us whether we've set up a thing for students to do that really keeps some players out of the game for a reason that's not really relevant or is based on some assumption that we've made along the way. I can't imagine doing it any other way. Well, just because we can't imagine it doesn't mean it's not possible. It means we haven't imagined enough. 
And we may get there and say, you're right, we can't do it any other way, and we've done the analysis, and this is the deal. But until we've done the analysis, it isn't really fair to the student to say no, is it? Just because we haven't taken the time to be more imaginative. So let's have a look at a requirement and see if we can unpack it using some of these principles. So this is a science assignment, and I have to give credit to a colleague in a class I took who gave me this example. This is a lab experiment on the chemistry of soap. Okay? So the objective here is that after independently conducting an experiment to demonstrate the different effect of soap in a fat-based medium and a water-based medium, students will describe the chemical bonds that allow soap to remove dirt from substances. Okay? So we're going to look at soap and how it works in a fat-based substance or in a water-based substance. So the students go and they do their experiment, but you know, there are a lot of ways they could do this. How many ways could you do this? How many kinds of disability accommodations could you think of in advance to make it accessible learning? So you're not waiting for the student with a disability to come along and say, I can't hold the pipette, I can't stir this standing up, I can't stand in this lab this long, I can't write the notes by hand at the same time I'm doing this lab, right? So if you think about how many ways students can collaborate to do that, would it be sufficient, for instance, for a student to say, I can't manipulate the pipette to drop the soap into the fat and the water. Can my lab assistant do that? Or can a naive observer do that? And I just instruct every step of the way. They don't know what they're doing. I say, pick up the pipette, depress the bulb, put it in the soap. If I do that, am I demonstrating the knowledge? Maybe I am. So I would ask you to think about your course requirements in that kind of creative way. Is it rationally connected? Yep. Is it established in good faith, those requirements? Yes, of course. Is there evidence that it needs to be done in the way you've designed it to be done? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. And did you set it up in a way that some people would not be able to do it? Did you assume everyone would be standing? Did you assume everyone would be handling their own pipette? Did you assume anything that would keep someone out of it? Just think ahead about that. So, as we're looking at this, we're looking more and more at how we design the environment to be inclusive. And that really raises the question, where lies the disability? Are we talking about the kind of definition we saw in the act, which was all those conditions and lists of conditions right, very body focused, medically based, or are we looking at how we can create the environment? We actually have no control over those conditions, right? We are in education, we are not in rehab or treatment. So we're not going to go and fix that person's sore thumb, we're not going to repair the learning disability or get over it, we're going to take that person as they are and look at how we construct an environment that they can either participate in or not based on some choices we've made. So that puts the disability in the environment. So the legal test questions, you'll notice, did not quantify the student's disability. They didn't say, oh, well, students with this reading speed can take the course and read in this way and those can't. Right? It didn't focus on that. The test questions focus on the construction of requirements such that people with disabilities, or in the UDL context, a wide variety of learning styles, have an equal opportunity. And it speaks to the need for an accessible and inclusive environment. So this is where the mandate to accommodate, the duty to accommodate requirement, pulls us past reactive models and into a proactive approach to inclusion using UDL. So what is this stuff we're talking about? Everything starts with a U. It's really confusing. There are different initials. Some people say it's this. Some people say it's that. I can't cope with this. We're going to have you coping with this by the end of this video. So let's take a look at where these principles started. And universal architectural design principles came along when a fellow named Ron Mace, who was an architect with a disability, thought, you know, there's got to be a way to make this more systemically applicable and accessible. So if people had principles about how to design stuff, everything would get more accessible. So that's universal architectural design. We'll talk more about that in a second. From that grew some notions about universal instructional design. So then educators come along and say, hey, if we can build an accessible building, why can't we build an accessible curriculum? So let's look at this. 
So Ron Mace, as I mentioned, was an architect with um, quadriplegia and wanted to work on principles of universal design. And he came up with these seven principles. So there's the principle of equitable use. So anybody in the environment can get into that building equally easily. So if you're a very large person, there isn't a turnstile that keeps you out at the front. If you need a ramp, there is one. If you're better with stairs because of balance issues, there are stairs. Everybody can work in the environment and access it equally. There's flexibility of use. So the spaces can be used in a variety of ways. You can get in and out of a door in more than one way. You can push on it. You can push a button. Maybe it has an electric eye. The things should be designed to have simple and intuitive use. So uh, the example I love these days is that I have a door in my life that has an outward moving handle. Looks like it's a pull. No, it's a push. So it's not intuitive. It's not perceptible. I pull on that door every single time because it's got a pull handle. It doesn't have a push bar. Why do we do this to ourselves, <laughs> right? We have to have some tolerance for error. When we have tiny little power buttons on doors that you can only hit if you have really good eye-hand coordination and you know where that button is and you can hit it, and if you're a little bit off or you can't quite see it or your aim isn't great, you're going to miss that button, that's not tolerant of error. It doesn't enable people to take a risk and try something and succeed readily. Low physical effort. So when I was back in my OT life, we wanted to look at the accessibility of a door. We had the two-finger push test. If you can push the door open with two fingers, it's probably not too heavy. So how much physical effort does it take to get through a door or to get yourself up a ramp that's too steep on your manual chair, right? And then you need size and space approach for ease of use. So this is one you've probably all seen, maybe not. You roll up in your wheelchair to a door, you push the button or you pull the handle, you back up to make room for the door, and you're already rolling back down the ramp because the top of the ramp is only as big as the door swing. So there isn't enough size or space for you to approach the door, use the door, and not be rolling back down the ramp already. The top has to be flat enough for the door and for you. So that's about size and space for approach. So what on earth does all this building stuff have to do with curriculum? So universal architectural design relates quite explicitly to universal instructional design like point for point. So the notions in universal instructional design take us into the notion of fair and equitable use so all learners can participate in the learning opportunity. It says we should have flexible use and participation. There should be many ways of engaging with the material. It should be straightforward and consistent. So when you tell students this is what's required, it's the same every time they talk to you, every time they talk to each other, wherever it's in print, it's up on the learning management system, it's in their syllabus, it's all consistent and very straightforward. So it's not overcomplicated in language. So thinking of writing things in lay language, for instance, or in common and user-friendly terms, not overcomplicating things. Providing a really supportive environment, so that tolerance for error where you can have a supportive environment and take a risk. You can reach out and push something. You can try something and not completely fail. 100% exams would be an example that is not a supportive environment. No risk allowed. Minimizing physical effort, think about writing notes. Do you have to write them by hand? Can you digitally record them? Can you audio record them? Can you have a manual note taker? Can you do anything else that minimizes the physical effort for someone who may be challenged by that? And what about your learning spaces? How accessible are they? Can the students in chairs only sit at the front or only at the back? Can they get into the lab at all? Are you showing a film in a building that isn't accessible, but oops, that person in a chair in your class just will have to miss that movie, right? So how do we think about our teaching spaces so that they have sufficient size and space for approach and interaction? So we have another U term. We've done U universal instruction architectural design. Now we've done universal instructional design. So when we talk about these universal principles, architectural design or instructional design, we're looking really at an attitude about how to teach more diverse students or how to make our environments and our structures more inclusive, right? We're looking at techniques for accessible inclusive learning. We're looking at supporting standards that have flexible methods. So we're not talking about flexible standards. We're talking about consistent standards with flexible methods. 
we're talking about effective use of technology. That would mean engaging with, learning about, implementing, talking about how we use technology, not just prohibiting it, I might add. And we're talking about multiple delivery methods. So, for instance, this conversation, you can listen to it, you can watch it, you could have the text of it in print, you could have it in large print. So we're trying to give this to you in a number of ways, and you could also have someone come and give it to you live. We could talk anytime about that. So we can also find in all of these approaches an equal opportunity to participate. That's what universal is about, equalizing opportunity. So let's move on to design for learning. Taking that attitude into a more sophisticated model that looks at neuroscience and the psychology of learning, universal design for learning addresses and redresses the primary barrier to making expert learners out of all students. What is that barrier? One size fits all curricula. That raises unintentional barriers to learning that we could anticipate and preempt if we thought about how we design, right? So, a universally designed curriculum, and these are quotes from the Center for Applied Special Technology, which now calls itself CAST. I love the metaphor. Support, right? It's a supportive metaphor. Um, and CAST has written a lot about it. A lot of our sessions today are based on CAST material, and they're really the forefront leaders in universal design. And this is one of the other things they have to say about this, is that a universally designed curriculum is designed from the outset to meet the needs of the greatest number of users making costly, time-consuming, and after-the-fact changes unnecessary. If you think about it, after-the-fact changes are always more expensive, more difficult, more disruptive than the initial design phase was. So we're always looking at the cost of retrofits as much higher than the cost of building in. So this is calling upon us to design in inclusive strategies. So CAST has taken these notions that we've talked about, this attitude of more ways of incorporating learning and participation, and condensed them into three principles. Multiple means of representation, so we've touched on that with, for instance, the print and the reading formats. Multiple means of action and expression. How can you engage? Can you have a conversation? Can you have a dialogue? Do you write an essay? Do you have a blog? And multiple means of engagement. How do we get students to participate in an and engage with the material and then show us what they've learned from that. So let's just do a little exploding here for, of those principles and the UID principles. So here we have the seven principles of UID. You can see our very explicit, detailed kind of how-to pieces that relate to the UDL three principles of multiple means of representation, action and expression, and engagement. So if we think about how do we do that, UID steps kind of help us implement that, but UDL is a bigger idea. So, now we're at the point where we're going to try applying some of these principles to your curriculum. So let's take something that you require in your course or that you've been asked to accommodate or you've heard about someone trying to accommodate, and let's try one question and unpack it and see if you can apply the UDL principles. So think of something that you require of students that you really believe is a bona fide academic requirement and ask yourself this question. Is the requirement constructed such that it excludes various styles of learning for reasons that are not relevant? Think about that with your requirement. And if you come up with the answer that, you know, actually, yes, I could do this differently and I didn't think of how somebody else might have to do it, Let's then use your UDL principles. Are there multiple means of representing your curricular materials? Are there lots of ways that students can engage and act on that material? Are there many ways that they could engage and you would know they'd learn the material? So I would challenge you to think about that with your course objectives because really this is all about an opportunity to combine the legal test questions and the mandate to accommodate with proactive instructional design strategies, and that creates opportunity to meet the needs of learners while ensuring academic integrity. And for faculty, the opportunity is to design an environment and a curriculum that includes all learners to maximize their potential in a climate of equal opportunity. And for students, 
It's an opportunity to participate in an accessible learning environment that supports participation in all aspects of higher education. So here's your activity. Take two alternative ways to represent or convey the main idea of your curriculum. List two additional ways that students can physically perform the task or express their knowledge. And list two ways that students can exercise choice and autonomy in their participation. And that will help you make UDL a reality.